Milí diváci a posluchači, vítejte u prvního dílu cyklu Cesty emancipace, který pořádá časopis Kontradikce a Městská knihovna v Praze. Název dnešního pořadu je Black Lives Matter v Čechách. Hranice a výzvy mezinárodní solidarity. Moje jméno je Františka Šormová a jsem z francouzského výzkumného centra sociálních a humanitních věd. A věnuji se afroamerické literatuře a historii kontaktů mezi českem a československém a afroamerickou komunitou. A je to právě tato historie, na které bych ráda dnes představila hnutí Black Lives Matter. Já tady přednesu jakýsi teoretický úvod a tento pořad bude pokračovat v druhé části tím, že budeme diskutovat s Kelsey Roman, která byla jedna z organizátorek solidárních akcí, které proběhly v toto léto v Praze. Já začnu citací. Kdysi byl nástrojem linčování pro vás. Dnes je to policejní kulka. Pro mnoho američanů představuje policie vládu, nebo spíše její nejviditelnější představitele. Předkládáme důkazy o tom, že se zabíjení afroameričanů ve Spojených státech stalo policejní taktikou a že takto taktika také reprezentuje politiku americké vlády. Tyto věty by se docela dobře vyjímaly i na těm demonstracích spojených právě s hnutím Black Lives Matter, ale jsou přes 70 let staré. Jsou z petice We Charge Genocide, která byla v roce 1951 představena na valném schromáždění OSN. Tato petice mapuje institucionalizované násilí na afroameričanech a mimo jiné také obsahuje seznam men právě zabitých afroameričanů. A jsou to jména, které se často skandují na demonstraci Black Lives Matter. Um, je všeobecně známé, že toto hnutí vzniklo na základě hashtagu z roku 2013, ale již méně se mluví o tom, že tento hashtag uh, se zrodil v reakci na rozhodnutí soudu, který zprostil viny člověka, který vystřelil uh, a smrtelně zranil, který postřelil a zmit, uh, smrtelně zranil afroamerického teenagera Trayvona Martina. To hnutí nabíralo na síle, uh, například po násilné smrti Mikea Browna ve Fergusonu, Erika Garnera v New Yorku a dalších mužů a žen. Um, a podobně jako petice We Charge Genocide, o které jsem mluvila, upozorňuje tedy nejenom na samotnou policejní brutalitu, ale také na systémové nerovnosti, které se projeví mimo jiné v justičním systému. A proč vlastně o této petici mluvím? Ona byla představena i v Čechách, um, respektive v Československu. Uh, byla docela rychle přeložena do češtiny, vyšla v roce dva, uh, 1952 a byla přeložena jako Obvinujeme americkou vládu ze zločinu genocidia. Její autor, afroamerický právník William Peterson, také Československo navštívil um, v roce 1951. A on, Peterson byl afroamerický komunista a vlastně obě, obě složky uh, tady toho jeho určení, i, i to, že byl afroameričan, i to, že byl komunista, vlastně znamenalo, že byl v 50. letech v Americe perzekuován uh, v souvislosti nebo v, pro, v, v rámci procesu, které jsou v Čechách spojeny zvláště uh, s jménem senátora McCarthyho. A Peterson, který tušil to, co se později stalo, a to sice, že mu bude odebrán pas, když na začátku 50. let navštívil Československo, tak sebou přivezl seznam požadavků, které měly vlastně prohloubit kontakty mezi Afroameričany a Československem. Afro, afroamerické noviny měly referovat o technických pokrocích v Československu a naopak Československý tisk měl více informovat o boji právě černožského lidu. Petr jsem také požadoval, aby se po významných osobnostech afroamerické historie přejmenovávaly ulice, um, nebo aby se zvaly významné osobnosti, což mělo zároveň vytvořit tlak na americkou vládu, protože právě tyto osobnosti později stejně jako Peterson um, často nemohly cestovat. Peterson vlastně požadoval větší pokrytí tématu v československém tisku a to je jeden z požadavků, které, které, který mu byl splněn. On taky mimo jiné třeba po, požadoval finance na rodící se boj za občanská práva a žádné peníze nedostal. Ale v československém tisku se hodně psalo právě o boji černožského lidu, jak to Petersen formuloval. Nicméně toto téma nebylo vůbec nové. Ono se objevuje už v 19. století, zejména v souvislosti s českými cestovateli do Spojených států, kteří právě často popisují situaci afroameričanů tam. Um, Tito cestovatelé přitom, um, když afroameričany popisují, tak, poří, tak um, vyslovují určitou paralelu mezi situací afroameričanů v Americe 
a Čechů a Slováků v rámci Rakousko-Uherského impéria. Um, bohužel toto paralela jim ale nezabraňuje v tom, že ty jejich popisy afroameričanů úplně odpovídají dobovému uh, diskurzu, ale jsou úplně uh, stejně stereotypní jako popisy všech ostatních cestovatelů. Nicméně tato paralela bude ještě pro nás důležitá, jak uvidíme. Takže kontakty mezi Československem a afroamerickou komunitou už tu byly a studená válka je prohloubila. Mimo jiné to třeba znamenalo vydávání afroamerických knih, tedy knih afroamerických spisovatelů. Známý příklad je například afroamerický básník Langston Hughes, který si také se svými českými překladateli dopisoval. Ale zároveň tím, jak toto téma bylo z velké části také ordinováno z hora, um, tak již brzy kolovaly vtipy o tom, jakým způsobem se vlády nejenom v Československu, ale v celém sovětském uh, bloku snaží toto téma využít, aby odlákali pozornost od represe, která probíhala doma. Um, Vzhledem k tomu, že se toto téma vystěhovalo v tisku, v politických projevech a například také v doslovech ke knihám, tak se z něho později stala jakási úlitba režimu nebo retorická strategie. A jak již jsem řekla, tak to trošku znamenalo určité vyprázdnění právě uh, nějakého solidárního aspektu ve vztahu k tomuto tématu. Um, ono je zajímavé, že ono se to ještě později proměnilo. A v rámci uh, například spirituálu, což je další naprosto fascinující téma, které tady raději ani nebudu načínat, tak se vytvořila jiná paralela. A to sice Čechů, kteří uh, čelí tomu komunistickému útlaku, podobně jako například afroameričané v historii otroctví. Um, takže je to další paralela, ale můžeme si všimnout, že podobně jako u paralely Čechů v rakousko uherské monarchii, úplně mizí ten důvod o prese samotné. Není v ní vlastně vůbec reflektována nějaká specifičnost rasismu. Um, myslím, že v Čechách z různých uh, historických a regionálních důvodů je více pozornosti věnováno působení uh, kategorií, jako je etnicita nebo národnost, ale ta historická kategorie rasy a rasismu a jak vlastně rasismus funguje uh, na strukturální úrovni byla často opomíjena. A to je hodně důležité proto, protože ono to ovlivňuje, jak vlastně Uh, vidíme svět, uh, jak přemýšlíme a uh, systémový rasismus je něco, kde si vlastně nemůžeme vybrat, um, nemůžeme být jenom pasivní. Oni třeba ty afroameričtí autoři často dneska říkají, že ono nestačí být, nebýt rasista, ale že je potřeba být aktivně antirasista, přemýšlet, proč svět vidíme tak, jak ho vidíme, uh, pracovat se svými postoji, přemýšlet například o tom, od koho si odsedáme v tramvaji, kdy si kontrolujeme kabelku, jestli vnímáme peněženku, uh, nebo kdy voláme policii ve chvíli, uh, kdy nás někdo upozorní, že náš pes není na vodítku, jak se to například stalo letos v létě v parku v New Yorku. On je to docela bolestivý proces, který samozřejmě možná nemá uh, žádný konec. A já jsem asi trošku zaujatá svojí láskou pro afroamerickou literaturu, protože mám pocit, že strašně dobře je to například vidět na různých dílech, ať už současných nebo starších afroamerických autorů. Já mám takovou oblíbenou básničku, která se jmenuje Claudia Rankin a ta často produkuje takové krátké texty, jsou to nevím, možná básně nebo básně v próze nebo takové krátké prózy o tom, čemu ona říká mikroagrese. A to může být úplně drobná věc, nebo naopak věc, která vypadá drobně, ale uh, má vlastně docela neuvěřitelné důsledky nebo implikace. No a ta Claudia Rankin právě v jednom z těch te svých textů, on je to text, který je celý ve druhé osobě. Um, a říká, tak jednou prostě jdete do kina se svým partnerem nebo partnerkou a necháte hlídat svého kamaráda, aby vám pohlídal dítě. A v jedné chvíli vám do toho kina hrozně poděšeně volá soused a říká, že před vaším domem je nějaký hrozivý černý muž, který hrozně naštvaně mluví do telefonu a že on, tedy ten soused nebo sousedka, se tím cítí docela ohrožení a že volají policii. Vy zavoláte tomu kamarádovi a říkáte, prosím tě, je tam někdo před tím domem nebo co se děje? On říká, ne, 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 já jsem zrovna venku, telefonuju tady a, a nic nevidím. Takže uh, vy jedete domů, jste celý vyděšení, samozřejmě ve chvíli, když už přijedete, tak se všechno vysvětlilo, policie tam není, váš kamarád se prá, přátelsky baví se sousedkou a vám je z toho celého tak trošku trapně a tak říkáte tomu kamarádovi, ale víš co, jako, m, by, by se radši příště telefonovat dozadu za barák a ne takhle dopředu. A on se na vás jen tak podívá a říká vám, ale já si můžu telefonovat, kde chci. A vy říkáte, samozřejmě, samozřejmě. No, abych se vrátila k těm českým spojitostem hnutí Black Lives Matter, 
um, tak já jsem vypozorovala vlastně několik takových tendencí. Um, myslím, že jedna z nich souvisí s takovou záměrnou chybou v překladu nebo záměrnou nepřeložitelností, když například reakce typu, že český prezident Miloš Zeman označil hnutí za rasistické a to je takové, myslím, jak jsem už řekla, záměrné neporozumění, um, neuznání toho, že to hnutí nemluví o výlučnosti uh, nebo nějaké, že to jsou jenom určité životy, na kterých záleží, ale upozorňuje právě na ty systémové nespravedlnosti, jako když nejsou potrestáni vrazy. Um, další tendence by byla říkat, že nás se to vlastně vůbec netýká, ale myslím, že se to dost mění. Uh, třeba v souvislosti s tím, že v rámci hnutí Black Lives Matter se často tematizují i jiné menšiny, a také i proto, že se nově více reflektuje uh, například život příslušníků africké diaspory v Čechách, uh, například přítomnost studentů nebo pracovníků z afrických zemí během studené války nebo i třeba české zapojení do koloniálního systému. Um, a, taková, a myslím, že to se trošku mění i díky reflexi privilegií, která souvisí třeba um, nevím, s naším nebo s mým běložstvím a Um, také s tím, jak byla i tato kategorie uh, konstruována, protože samozřejmě nějaká bělost nebo běložství je taky nestálá a historicky určovaná kategorie. A je třeba zajímavé, když už se bavíme o Spojených státech amerických, že v imigrační politice Spojených států uh, slované obecně nebyly považováni v určitých historických dobách uh, za bílé. No ale abych se vrátila, uh, já tady mluvím o těch 50. letech tolik, protože to byla vlastně doba největšího zájmu o afroamerickou komunitu, pak se sice nějaký zájem ještě objevil, například zahraniční korespondent Karel Kinchel udělal rozhovor s Martinem Lutherem Kingem, nebo například tisk se velmi zajímal o návštěvu Angely Davis v Československu, ale jsou to opravdu 50. léta, které zůstávají takovým nejvyšším bodem. Jezdil jsem například hodně afroamerický zpěvák, herec o sportovec Paul Robson, nebo v roce 1958 získal čestný doktorát nedaleko odsud v Karolínu W.E.B. Du Bois, afroamerický intelektuál, historik a sociální vědec. On se z, toho, z tohoto obřadu si zachoval i záznam, i máme jeho řeč, kde on mluví, že si vlastně hodně cení toho, že dostal tento doktorát v době, kdy mu americké univerzity vůbec nemůžou přijít na jméno. V souvislosti s hnutím Black Lives Matter se také často mluví o hnutí o občanská práva a také o tom, jakým způsobem o něj soupeřilo několik názorových skupin a že nakonec mělo asi trošku jinou podobu, než si někteří z těch skupin představovali, například i třeba Peterson nebo Robson. A s hnutím Black Lives Matter je spojovaná šance dokončit právě to, co se možná ještě nepodařilo v těch 60. letech. Na, druhou stranu, na jednu stranu se často vyzdvihuje právě to, jakým způsobem hnutí za občanská práva přispěl k odstranění legálních zábran, například ve vztahu k vzdělání, k volbě profese nebo k politické reprezentaci afroameričanů. Na druhou stranu se málo kdy mluví o tom, že třeba hnutí za občanská práva bylo původně velmi silně zaměřené i na ekonomické otázky. A to jsou vlastně problémy, které pořád zůstávají. Zásadní rozdíly ukazují statistiky například v bydlení, ve výši příjmů, v délce života v dětské úmrtnosti, zdravotní péči. U afroamerické komunity je vysoká nezaměstnanost a přestože tvoří jenom 13 populace Spojených států, tak vlastně tvoří polovinu všech vězněných lidí v USA. Ještě bych zmínila ráda jednu věc v souvislosti s hnutím za občanská práva, a to sice, že my musíme trošku brát v úvahu ten kontext, ve kterém probíhala, to znamená studená válka, ale i dekolonizační procesy. A to, že vlastně USA mělo a muselo prezentovat um, v dobrém světle i v otázce své rasové politiky. A to samozřejmě vytvářelo další tlak na změnu legislativy, ale také hodně ovlivnilo tu výslednou podobu tohoto hnutí a jeho výsledku. A jedna z věcí, která se ztratila, je například právě nějaký rozměr mezinárodní solidarity nebo nějaký globální rozměr připomínání osudu celé černožské diaspory. A znovu, to je opět věc, ve které se do hnutí Black Lives Matter vkládají velké naděje. Um, to hnutí je decentralizované, ale má 13 zásad, které najdeme na jejich stránce a jedno z nich právě mluví o globální černožské rodině a zároveň přiznává, že um, jsou různé specifické podmínky. Ve, který, ve kterých členové této rodiny a členky, členky a členové této rodiny žijí. Um, ona je samozřejmě otázka, do jaké míry ta dominantní pozice 
Um, do jaké míry vlastně to, jakým způsobem se rychle rozšířilo toto hnutí, také nesouvisí um, a nereflektuje třeba nějakou hegemonickou pozici USA. Uh, nicméně, já jsem tady vyjádřila nějaké pochyby o tom, uh, o nějaké třeba přeložitelnosti těch hnutí nebo o nějakých uh, nedorozumění v překladu, které, uh, na, které jsou spojený, spojené s různým pochopením toho, co je to rasismus a jak funguje. Ale myslím si, že hnutí Black Lives Matter um, staví tento strukturální a systémový rasismus do centra a říká, že i v různých situacích může fungovat podobně. A otevřeně vlastně podporuje to, že se, k němu, že se přidávají další témata a další skupiny, ať už se jedná o původní obyvatele Austrálie nebo třeba v Čechách Chromy a jejich jména se právě přidávají na uh, ty seznamy, um, které se skandují na demonstracích. Um, myslím, že to, toto rámování vlastně umožňuje, aby ty solidární akce, jako například proběhly v Praze, v Brně a v Ostravě, o kterých se tady ještě budeme bavit s Kelsey, mohly být založeny i na těch univerzálních konceptech i využívat ty, ta lokální témata. Um, mimo jiné se třeba upozorňovalo v rámci těchto akcí na rasově motivované násilí v Čechách a situace právě různých menšin. Um, ale myslím, že nemizí ani ta, ten rozměr vyjádření solidarity s afroameričany, a i vlastně přiznání, jak moc se nás to téma týká, jak v Čechách, tak v Evropě, a taky propojenost těch otázek, které to hnutí přináší a převzetí nějaké zodpovědnosti za sdílený svět. Tak a já už jsem zmínila ty demonstrace a teď bych asi ráda přišla k druhé části programu, kdy se budeme konkrétně bavit právě o těch pražských demonstracích. Um, so we are switching to English now, and it's my pleasure to welcome here Kelsey Roman, who is a, a translator and also a language teacher, but she was also one of the organizers of the Black Lives Matter um, demonstration that took place in Prague um, this June. So Kelsey, welcome. Great to have you here. Thank you for having me. So how did you become a part of the organization team? Was it through some activist circles or did you... How did it happen? So what was really interesting about this was that it was completely spontaneous, um, I think, for most of the people who got involved. Um, we all saw the video of George Floyd's murder. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I know that I was and other people were searching for some outlet to show our support um, for the Black Lives Matter movement um, that didn't currently exist in Prague, especially as expats uh, who were so far away from home uh, and felt <coughs> helpless to do anything else. Um, so somebody started a Facebook event um, asking for help in organizing, and a few people who had never previously met gathered together um, just a few days later, and they became the people who organized the event. Mm -hmm. um, well, we mentioned that the Black Lives Matter is a decentralized movement. Was there any contact between kind of the US chapters and the Prague group, or how did it go? So we did reach out to um, the American chapters for guidance. But in order to officially establish um, like a BLM chapter, you have to register as like a nonprofit. And we thought that the amount of time that we had to like organize, there wasn't really a point in, in doing all of that paperwork. There were also some concerns um, about uh, maintaining anonymity, especially because we were organizing a protest in a country that we were not familiar with, uh, you know, um, even though the Czech Republic has free speech, um, it was during the pandemic. And so instead of uh, taking the route of organizing so openly um, alongside the Black Lives Matter chapters, we took their advice and organized more privately. Talking about organizing the demonstrations, um, I know that you're a translator and you also mentioned when we previously corresponded some issues of translation and translatedness of the rhetorics of the Black Lives Matter demonstrations to the Czech context and Czech environment. So 
Um, was it something that you encountered during these preparations? Yeah, I would certainly say that um, the idea, the ideas of uh, racial uh, justice um, and um, politics concerning the lives of people of color, they're not very popular ideas in the Czech Republic, um, partially because they're such a homogenous society, partially because the Czech Republic doesn't have a colonial history. Um, oftentimes when we were trying to talk to Czech people about these issues, um, for them it was, it was very theoretical. Mm -hmm. And so it was it was hard to translate the kind of feelings of urgency or um, just the kind of message of these are lives that we are trying to protect and promote because there wasn't that immediate need in the social circles of most Czech people that we knew. Mm -hmm. uh, based on the group that organized these events, uh, events you also mentioned that there were people who had this kind of um, ancestry of their parents met, for example, because they um, they worked um, either in a, an African country or their parents came here to work here and then they met. Um, so this kind of um, family history. So I was going to ask whether maybe this hegemonity or hegemony, racial hegemony isn't partly also a myth that the Czech people like to tell themselves that, you know, the Czech society is and has always been totally white. I absolutely believe it's a myth, um, and I was not aware that it was until uh, I started participating in um, Black Lives Matter related activities here. Um, the really interesting uh, thing is that although Czech people and even you know Czech people who happen to be of color or happen to have uh, ancestry that traces back to Africa, Uh, sort of keep to themselves and, and, and don't openly organize. Uh, around this event, people started emerging and sharing very similar stories of you know feeling that they had experienced prejudice, feeling that they had grown up constantly uncomfortable mm -hmm. um, with identifying with both their race and identifying as Czech. Um, and I think we had hoped to step back and eventually allow them to take up the platform of uh, racial politics in the Czech Republic, and that became our goal. You also mentioned a group where these people organized. Could you maybe tell us more about that? Uh, yeah, so there's currently a group of university-age uh, students called Melanin Kids uh, CZ, and I know that They are like a cultural hub for people who have African ancestry, but also identify as Czech to meet and share experiences. That's fascinating. Thank you. Um, looking at these demonstration that took demonstrations that took part in Prague, um, there were two of them and you took part in both um, and they were only a week apart. So why two? So the initial organizing that I was a part of was done almost solely by expats for expats. Um, the entire protest, it was almost completely the expat community. We were a little saddened and disappointed that we couldn't seem to find Czech solidarity in this. Um, and in fact, it turned out that there was a Czech movement that was organizing on behalf of, you know, Black Lives Matter ideas. Um, we were able to make contact with them and that became the second protest. But I found it a little discouraging that there was no initial communication. Like the, both groups were completely unaware of each other. They were able to come together at the end and organize something together. Um, but there hadn't been communication because these issues just aren't openly communicated about. Mm -hmm. um, two, question to two questions to follow up on that. Um, is it difficult to organize in English? That's one. And then second, maybe more complicated, did you personally or generally experience um, any issues with maybe like white activists trying to take your 
place or the opposite, um, which would be maybe something like tokenism, which we might really quickly explain um, a phenomena when um, a certain person representing is taken as a representative of a whole race or mm, a whole gender and then it's put in a position where um, everybody can say look we also have this woman on our team or this African American on our panel so it's all okay and it's super diverse um, so have you experienced any of these two yeah phenomena? I would say that uh, tokenism um, is something that I have experienced but It's also not something that personally bothers me. In giving speeches, I recognized optically that there was a need for a person of color to be present and to be talking about their experiences. And a lot of people felt uncomfortable with doing this, um, particularly the Czech people who also had African ancestry expressed that they were frightened of receiving racist backlash. Um, and this surprised me as well to hear because I wasn't aware of how deep these issues were rooted in Czech society up until this point. So I ended up making speeches at both protests in a, in almost like a tokenistic sense because I felt, you know, I had a responsibility as someone of color to take that place uh, at the mantle if no one else would. Mm -hmm. um, I experienced, I was at the first demonstration and my, um, my kind of um, impression was that it was different from the usual other Czech demonstration in, in, in that in demonstrations in that it was very emotional mm -hmm. and also very physical with people lying down or um, I mean all sorts of gestures and um, also singing. Um, do you, is that something that was negotiated somehow the form of the protests, maybe the translation of the form of the US protests into the specific form of a demonstration in Prague on Staromětské náměstí? Well, I would say that it was all organized on the ground. The original event, there had been some hesitation uh, due to the pandemic. Um, and so we were very unsure if it was even happening. There were questions as to what we were going to do. And then people started showing up. And in that moment, myself and a few others took over and organized it to reflect what we thought was, you know, the protest format that we had seen in the United States. But the truth is, so much of that was spontaneous. Um, at some point, uh, we opened the floor for any person of color who felt comfortable doing so to come up and speak. And what we got out of that was, you know, chanting, music, um, very personal and emotional expressions about experiencing racism. Uh, and I think that actually made it all the more powerful. In your speech during the first demonstration, you also mentioned your personal experiences growing up. So would you mind maybe sharing some of it with us now? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to. Um, so growing up, I actually was under the impression that police brutality was something completely normal um, and I thought that the racial bias that police seemed to demonstrate was only to be expected. Um, personally, in the social circles that I operated in back home in Miami, I am aware of four police-related deaths uh, just growing up between the ages of 14 and 20. Um, Three of them were kids who attended my high school, and uh, one happened while I was in university. But in each of these cases, it never really struck me that this was abnormal. There was just the idea that, oh, the police are racist and they can't be trusted and everyone knows this. And it was only really at the point of seeing how people were like pouring into the streets for George Floyd that I feel like I let go of that sense of helplessness um, and thought maybe 
something can be done to change this reality. Well, thank you for sharing that. Um, you told me that you have been living here um, a bit over a year, right? Um, have you experienced any racist behavior here in the Czech Republic? And have you observed any differences in the way racism demonstrates here? Um, because you mentioned that y the initial reactions of some Czechs that you encountered with the idea of the demonstration was that racism is something that happens elsewhere, not here, which in itself could be maybe um, seen in that way. But I was wondering about other experiences you might have had. Sure. I mean, I feel that my experiences with overt racism actually really started surrounding the organizing of um, these protests. Um, you know, leaving them, there were monkey noises, um, friends of mine were followed um, and, and called derogatory terms referring to their race and these sorts of like overt instances, they were only very obvious around the protests and personally I feel lucky that we were protesting in Prague because there were other protests in other parts of the Czech Republic um, where skinheads emerged with Confederate flags and um, reports of violence um, and attacks on people of color at those protests from skinheads. Um, so that was my first encounter with the obvious racism with like the big R. But unfortunately, what I come across more than anything is a sort of apathy. Like even friends of mine um, who are Czech have told me that in trying to discuss issues of race in the Czech Republic, um, I'm battling windmills um, to reference uh, the Don Quixote. Uh, that it's just an uphill battle that cannot really be reached because there isn't there isn't a passion in people to address it. Um, even the people who are willing to work with us and who seem to be on the same ideological page as we were, um, were politically positioned far enough away from the mainstream that association with them made just addressing the question of race seem like a radical idea here. Well, that kind of brings up parallels with you know the situation in the U.S. when the very kind of when you were dealing with the issues of racism, you could be um, accused of being a communist or radical, despite perhaps not not being that. Um, some of course were, but some were not. So, um, yeah. Um, so you mentioned apathy, uh, but you also mentioned these violent reactions. Do you maybe recall which city was it in? Because I know that protests took place, as I said, I think in uh, two in Prague and then Brno and Ostrava. So I am aware that um, there was an attack on a woman uh, in Brno um, by a group of uh, men who I would identify as skinheads. They had shaved heads and Confederate flags, and they were protesting against the Black Lives Matter protest in Brno. Okay. Oh, well, um, have you followed at all the Czech reactions to the Black Lives Matter movement and the demonstrations taking place in the U.S.? Yes. Uh, yes, I have. Um, and I've found it really fascinating because I have come across some supportive rhetoric but a lot of it was you know you have this cover from respect magazine that is somehow trying to associate the black lives matter movement with hitler purely for shock value which uh, uh, that was the reflex magazine i think but uh, yeah sorry sorry to interrupt just yeah, just to be right, precise right, yeah, yeah, yeah. respect is reflex magazine yeah so reflex magazine did this they did this uh cover where they associate Hitler with the Black Lives Matter for shock value. And it occurs to me that this issue is so theoretical in the minds of Czech people that they're not aware of the real living black and brown people in the country that these kinds of things hurt. Um, there was that. Uh, there was accusations that this was some leftist agenda that was being imported in from America. And 
Uh, unfortunately, you have Zeman himself who called the Black Lives Matter uh, movement racist without, I believe, a full understanding of the context of the movement. Um, you said earlier that there was very little solidarity that you encountered during organizing these demonstrations. But I would like to ask you whether you saw these events more as uh, maybe solidarity, solidarity, expressions of solidarity or solidarity demonstrations or as a kind of a call to action for the Czech anti-racist cause. I think initially it started off as solidarity with the protests that were occurring in America, which is why they ended in front of the American embassy, particularly to call attention to uh, the injustice that was occurring in America. However, the deeper that I started looking into the Czech experience of racism and the more that I talked to people who happened to grow up in the Czech Republic while being a person of color, the more I realized that Czech people as a society hold some responsibility to reflect on their actions and their ideology and how they promote racism in their day-to-day -day lives, whether that be uh, through apathy or, or, or ignorance or whether it be through actively insulting those who are different because the latter is less common, but the former allows a lot of pain to go unnoticed. Um, the Roma people were frequently mentioned um, in connection to Black Lives Matter in uh, Czechia, whether it should be Roma Lives Matter here. Um, do you think there, th there is a relevant connection? I absolutely do. I think it's a very astute uh, connection to, to make. Um, when I was doing my research, I learned a lot about uh, the status of Roma in the Czech Republic. And although I have not lived here long, it seemed apparent to me that there was so much prejudice surrounding this group of people that even other activists were afraid to bring it up because they were worried about sort of tarnishing the initial cause of Black Lives Matter. Um, and so when people in the Czech media started to come forward and say, well, we should be applying these, these politics uh, to address how the Roma are treated in the Czech Republic, I thought that was really promising. I also felt that perhaps it was not my place um, without having a longer familiarity with the country to speak up. Um, but I really was uh, pleased to see that there was a Roma activist speaker at the second protest. Yeah. Um about this media connections, what they sometimes hinted at, at was um, a kind of exclusionary, that maybe when we say Roma lives matter here, we shouldn't be talking about black lives matter also, which is something which made me a bit nervous about that rhetoric, but um, because we obviously need to talk about both. Um, but I agree with you that this was actually a very positive development, especially because often when reporting from uh, the events from in the US, the media, focused very much on the loitering and the riots and violence during protests instead of the actual initial uh, racial violence that started them. Um, I talked in my introduction, I talked a bit about maybe a problematic history of solidarity between um, the African-American community and Czechia and Czechoslovakia. Um, following up on that history, you mentioned that, again, you mentioned that solidarity was something that you found missing. Um, but do you think there is something to follow up on? Is there, do you think there is a hope yes. for? Yes. Um, so from my understanding of the history of the solidarity that existed prior to the civil rights movement, um, one of the reasons that that solidarity decreased was that there was this idea of like, okay, the civil rights movement has happened and the suffering has been alleviated. And people here were not aware 
of the continuing uh, discrimination that existed in housing, in banking, in, uh, in uh, getting professions, in the criminal justice system that kept people of color, particularly black people in America and Hispanic people in America, from gaining intergenerational wealth and, and from rising out of like poverty cycles. Mm -hmm. So there was this idea that, okay, at this point, people are responsible for themselves because the system is no longer failing them. And it wasn't true. It still isn't true. The system is still failing these people. Um, and I'd like to think that if we were to be able to educate um, the Czech population on exactly how the system continues to fail people, um, uh, people of color, particularly in America, that they would recognize that fellow humanity and that felt that suffering again and be more willing to acknowledge it. Um, yes, this is this is I'm glad you pointed it out because this was also a frequent reaction of the Czech media or people who were uh, talking about uh, the Black Lives Matter movement here publicly. And then they frequently mentioned that, again, the civil right, rights movement happened. Um, and so what more would the African-Americans want? Um, and also showing this misunderstanding of that if you get a legal change and a legal representation, maybe it doesn't necessarily change the economic pattern. So I was wondering if you could maybe talk a bit more about that. Uh, sure. So for decades after the civil rights movement, um, there was a, a cyclical issue of people being unable to get mortgages from banks and there's uh, there was policy for banks to discriminate in giving mortgages to people so they were unable to buy property furthermore buying property in a nicer neighborhood as a person of color would lower the retail value of the properties around um, so What ended up happening was that real estate agents were also refusing to sell. So you have people who are not able to own property um, and are not able to collect on that asset of wealth over many years of time. Uh, at the same time, the education system in America works in a way that the property taxes fund the schools. So when the property taxes fund the schools, and you particularly are living in a neighborhood where the property is priced much lower, those schools are getting less funding. So you're sending your kids into a school where they're getting a worse education because it has less funding. And then there is uh, the prejudice that people face in the criminal justice system as well. It starts very young where um, black kids particularly are more likely to be penalized for uh, disciplinary issues. Um, so you have the bad schooling being penalized for disciplinary issues. You're growing up in this bad neighborhood. Um, you are more likely to fail out of school and perhaps involve yourself in criminal activity or have more trouble getting into university or have trouble getting uh, a good job that supports you. You don't have the generational support of having a family-owned property. And the cycle continues again and again, um, up until the point that it's hard for people today in 2021 to just say, you know, oh, civil rights happened in the 60s and you know, slavery ended in the 1800s and therefore the problems are over because these are real setbacks that affect each following generation. Thank you. Um, we have time for one more question. Um, this format invites questions from the audience and in the next events or episodes, there will be more probably also joined by a live discussion. Uh, but right now we have gathered one question um, and that is, uh, where do you see the future of the movement both in the US and uh, also here in Czechia, whether there are more events planned? Uh, because Especially judging from the media coverage, there was a lot of um, a lot of it uh, in the summer, and then it kind of quieted down um, in the fall and in winter. Although the protests are still happening, still continuing. So, where do you see the future of Black Lives Matter? I think that Black Lives Matter will have its place in American history. 
uh, as something revolutionary in the way that um, black people in America and on an international scale are perceived. Even just the protests over the past year have fundamentally changed the perception of, of, of black people uh, according to polls taken across the country. However, I do feel that the movement does not resonate globally in all cases, and I don't feel that it is the best approach in the Czech Republic to address uh, inherent racial bias. I think that this happens to be a country where political passion is not necessarily encouraged and more of a dialogue needs to be created, not necessarily protests in the streets, but articles and places where people can read them and conversations where people can see them so that the ideas keep flowing. So it's not that the ideology behind Black Lives Matter um, wouldn't be relevant here as much as the approach of pouring into the street, I don't think is a good fit for Czech society. And I don't think it will continue here. Okay, well, something to think about. Um, and I would like you. Uh, I would like to thank you, Kelsey, for join joining us today. And good luck with your political activity in the future. Thank you so much.